uh, Meg with the Rhinestone Cattle Company in New York. And she's going to share some tips and tricks that every grazer can use. Well, good afternoon, everybody. So happy to see all of you here. My name is Meg. Last name is pronounced Griskevich, but you can just go with Meg G. I am from the Buffalo, New York area. It's a little bit about me before we get started. I went to school at West Virginia University, got a degree in livestock and agribusiness, and then I went to work for Greg Judy in Missouri for six months. And that's where I pretty much learned everything I know. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking to you about today, I learned either from him or from someone else. I'm just up here for the purpose of disseminating that information to a bunch of people who wouldn't normally hear it. I'm going to start by talking about what I'm not going to talk about. And that is university research, a bunch of in-depth studies, a bunch of graphs, a bunch of numbers, abstract theories, or large-scale production changes that you would have to take a lot of time or a lot of money or infrastructure to implement on your farm. So I'm not going to be up here telling you to change all of your genetics, to build a whole bunch of fence, build a whole bunch of water, or to make drastic changes. And this stuff is all stuff that you can do when you go home today. So you can walk out of your pasture and start doing. So it doesn't require a whole lot of capital expenditure. It doesn't require a whole lot of physical strength. And it applies to every type of farm. Whether you're beef or dairy, whether you're grass-fed or feeding concentrates, whether you're a big farm or a small farm, age doesn't matter, labor doesn't matter. So this is stuff that's pretty much universal. And before we get started, I'm going to say a couple of things housekeeping-wise. I'm going to take a couple of short breaks here because we're going to be here for an hour and a half. So we're going to stop at 1.55 because there is the climate change focus group going on. So anybody who wants to go to that can get up at 1.55 and leave. And then we're going to take another break at around 2.15 because there's a session ending, so that would allow people to shuffle around between those sessions. So that way you can go to the bathroom, check your phone, do whatever you need to do. Okay, so the first question you may have a lot of the times on your farm is, are my cattle getting enough to eat? This could be kind of a tricky thing to figure out. But there's an easy trick, checking a rumen fill. If you look at an animal with its head on your left side, you can see a spot just between the rib and the hip below the backbone where the rumen protrudes. And so you can see how much fill is in that rumen at any given time of the day. This cow is full. As you see in that spot, there is no depression in the rumen. Everything is nice and rounded. You can't see any kind of shadow. This cow has gotten plenty to eat, so she is producing at her absolute potential. This cow, 6 to 12 hours, may not have had enough food. You can see that the rumen's a little bit dented there. You can see a shadow. This is not a reason to panic, but it is a reason to maybe reevaluate your grazing strategies or your feeding plans. So if you have this happening and you're mob grazing or rotationally grazing, you may need to make your paddocks a little bit bigger to allow these cattle a little bit more feed. Or if you're doing stored feed or you're feeding in a barn in a dairy situation, you may need to bring the feed out a little bit sooner, move your feeding schedule up. But again, this isn't really that much of a problem. It's just more of a warning sign. <coughs> this is when you have a problem. If you're going out in your pasture and you're seeing a big sunken triangle on the left side of your animal, now you have to remember to look at it from your, from, with the head being on your left side. Because if you look at an animal with the head on the right side, it's always going to look like this, especially dairy cattle. There's always that sunken triangle. But on the left side, you should never, ever see this. This means that your animal has gone hungry for probably about 24 hours. This is how long it takes for it to get this bad. So this is going to require a management change. Now what you're going to do when you get home for trick number one is walk out to the pasture, look at three to five cows. You can do this multiple times a day. Obviously it takes two seconds to do. Floor rumens, you're good. Dented rumens, need to maybe move into a new paddock, feed them a little more. Just be advised of the situation. Empty rooms, again, probably is going to require a management change. This can be worth multiple BCS scores, keeping your animals full every day versus letting them get dented or letting them get empty. Second question, are my cattle eating the right stuff? Yeah, they might be eating enough, but are they eating the right stuff? Reading manure piles can tell you a lot about that. So here in this picture is an ideal manure pile. This is what you want them to look like. It's about one or two inches tall, concentric circles. You can see the little ripples in it. It looks kind of like a target. It's got that little sunken pond in it. And it holds its shape very well, but it's without being too tall. So in this one, the animal that dropped it, the rumen is functioning absolutely perfect. 
there's a great balance of protein, energy, and fiber, the three main components of a grass-fed diet. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio between all those things, but they are in balance, and the animal's rumen is making the best possible use of what it's taking in. <coughs> Here's another picture of that ideal pile. And you can see that the concentric circles and the proper height, it looks like a pie sheet. And then when you spread it with your foot, Greg Judy calls it pumpkin pie consistency. So it's going to be not too runny and not too lumpy, just nice and firm. And you can see that there's not a whole lot of undigested fibers in that. Everything is pretty much the same. Now this is when you start running into problems, when you have a lumpy consistency like this. This animal is taking in too much fiber and there's not enough energy or protein in the diet. This happens a lot when you're hay feeding or in the middle of a drought in the summer when your grasses start to lignify. Up here in the east we don't have that much of a problem with lignifying in the summer, but in this case you are going to have to do something about it. You will usually need to put out maybe a lip tub for energy or protein supplementation, or if you're on a pasture that you've been on for a couple days, it's time to move them to a new pasture. You have to start rotating a little bit faster so they can get a little more green in their diet. Now here's the opposite end of the spectrum. This is the runny manure pile. This happens mostly in the spring and in the fall when grass is growing quickly. It doesn't hold any shape at all, it's just a puddle on the ground, and if you step in it with your boot, it creates a huge mess. <laughs> a lot of people think this is normal. When you turn your cattle out in the spring, they get runny manure. I've heard the phrase used, can hit, hit you through a screen door at 20 paces. And the animal's butt usually is all covered with manure and stuff is caked on there. It almost looks like a calf that scours. If you're seeing that, this is not a good thing. It's not normal. This animal is taking in way too much protein, and that's definitely upsetting its rumen chemistry and its gain. When you have diarrhea, are you gaining weight? Are you feeling good? You're definitely not. What's so bad about all this protein? Here's a diagram of what actually happens inside an animal, digestion-wise, when you're eating protein. This is under a normal scenario where the protein is balanced well with energy and everything else, all the other components of the diet. So the animal eats the protein, it is metabolized to ammonia in the rumen, it's called deamination, the actual chemical reaction that occurs, which means the amine group is taken off the molecule, and that amine group is then, is then um, converted to urea, this happens in the kidneys, and that urea under normal circumstances goes into the bloodstream and then is filtered out of the bloodstream and into the urine, comes out of the body, everything's fine. Blood pH is normal. But when your animal is taking in too much protein, like usually happens on lush, washy spring grasses, or if your TMR, your feed mixture, is not quite right, the animal is going to be taking in that excess protein, and some of it passes through that normal channel, getting metabolized into ammonia and urea and then excreted. But you have the excess that the animal can't handle. And that ammonia ends up in the bloodstream where it causes all kinds of problems. The oxygen uptake in the lungs is messed up because your blood chemistry is messed up. So the animal can actually start showing symptoms of heat stress. It almost appears like fescue stress sometimes. But they're just standing there panting and not doing very well, not eating, standing in the shade all day. Poor feed efficiency, as happens any time that your diet is out of balance. Low gain or milk yield, which results any time you have low feed efficiency. Rumen alkalosis, which means that because this ammonia is an alkaline substance, it changes the chemistry of the rumen. And so the rumen microbes experience a shift, and that also further decreases feed efficiency. In extreme cases, you're going to have animals that fail to breathe if their blood pH goes up real high. And you can also have a bloat, which everybody knows. If you have too much protein, too much legume, they can end up with frothy bloat as a result of that rumen chemistry change as well. So how do we know if we're having a bit of a protein problem? You can test the urine pH very quickly and easily using pH strips or litmus paper. You can get this online or from any number of pool supply stores. So you have to make sure that the paper you get goes up in an alkaline range. The only numbers that we're really concerned about is between seven and nine. So in order how to test your cows, if you're in a dairy or a situation where your cattle are really tame, all you gotta do is wait for one to pee and then stick the strip into the urine stream. But a lot of us beef people can't get that close to our animals. So you have to go out to the pasture Usually when your animals are laying down or early in the morning, get them up because the first thing they do when they get up is pee. So then you watch them to pee and you run over to that spot and stick the strip in the grass right where they pee. It's hard to do this in the morning though sometimes because you've got to make sure that you are not getting dew, that what you're actually getting on that strip is urine. 
So if the pH of the animal's urine is between 7 and 7.9, that's okay. You don't have to worry too much about it. If you're the 8s, that is when you want to start to do some fixing in the diet to, to ameliorate this excess protein intake. And if you're at 8.8 or higher, or even into the 9s, you have a serious problem. You're going to have cows not breeding. Can I go back here? Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so what we're going to do when we get home about this is you're going to go out in the pasture and examine three to five cow pies. This is something you can do every day quickly and easily again. Just you have to make sure that they are fresh pies from within the past 24 hours. If they're lumpy, you're going to need to provide an energy or protein supplement. Get some more good stuff into the diet, either by moving them to a new pasture or making your pasture a little bit bigger or bringing out some supplementary lick tubs or something like that. And if they are runny, then we're going to have to start thinking about fixing the excess protein. In order to fix the excess protein, what you can do is supplement a little bit of dry matter if they're out on pasture. By a little bit, I mean a little bit. If you have a herd of 200 cows, if you bring out one square bale or one straw bale, that's all they're going to need. They're not going to eat altogether too much of it, just enough to fix their rumen chemistry. Because that dry matter, which is fiber, really balances out that extra protein in the gut. Another way to fix this is to, in order to manage your grazing so that you're leaving litter in the pasture. If you have a lot of litter or dry, dead grass mixed in with your new growing grass, the cattle, when they take a bite, are going to bite off a little bit of each one of those things. So that's kind of like a feed balance all in one, automatic. And you can make your pasture bigger or move the herd faster in order to make them eat just the tips of the plant instead of farther down. So on this diagram of the grass plant, according to Mark Bader, shows that the energy is up in the tips of the plants, whereas more of the protein is concentrated down the stalk in the bottom of the plant. So if you're making your animals eat down farther on the plant, they're going to be taking in more protein. So to fix the protein problem, you want to shift more up toward the tips. Another question. How do you select the cattle that are the best? How do you know which are your best genetics? Trick number four, selecting for slick off order. This is probably the easiest if you're using cattle that have a little bit of a tropical influence, like Greg Judy's cattle, which are South Pole. And those are half of red, those are red Angus, Hereford, plus some tropical breeds. And those have a really nice, slick, shiny coat in the summer. But you can do it with red Angus, Hereford, Northern breeds too. And they're all, it's all the same concept. So this animal has a nice, slick, shiny coat. This animal lost its hair very early in the spring, as soon as the weather started to change. And what that indicates is high hormonal function. So this animal's endocrine system is working at its absolute peak, and that means everything else is going to fall in place. Things like breeding, and growth, gain, libido, behavior, all of that is all tied to endocrine function. So this slick off is an indication of all of that. I'm sure we've all seen this calf before, calves that retain their hair coat well into the spring and summer. This is your animal that is not doing well all around. Again, hormonal function, that causes the slick off is also tied to everything else. So what to do with this is split your animals up into three categories based on when they slick off. So watch throughout the spring and write down tag numbers, write down data every day. So separate them into early spring slick off, late spring, and then summer or not at all. Only choose your replacement animals from that first category, the ones that are first to slick off. Yeah, like I said, you, this is all the stuff that I just talked about, choosing from only the first category. If you're daring, you can single trait select for this. All other traits will fall into place. I'm not sure if I'm quite that daring yet, but the theory is there. Okay, here's another way to determine which genetics are your best. Now we have two calves here. There's a 550 pound calf and a 450 pound calf. Just from first glance, which calf would you rather have? The big one, obviously. And which cat would you rather have? The one that gave you that big calf. Let's bring up the pictures of the dams. Big cow, little cow. 1,000 pound cow gave you that 450 pound calf. 1,500 pound cow gave you that 550 pound calf. Which, I mean, again, that may not change your answer. Big cow, big calf. But when we calculate the percentage of that calf's weight that the cow weaned, you're going to get the result that the 1,000 pound cow weaned 45% of her weight, whereas the bigger cow only weaned 36% of her weight. Now that in itself may not change your mind about the big cow, 
you might say, well, at a big cat, it's still going to sell for more. So let's look at how much those cattle ate. That big cow is going to eat 21,900 pounds of dry matter, according to my calculations, throughout one production year, which is what it takes to give you that one calf. So it took her 39.8 pounds of feed for every saleable pound of calf she gave you, whereas that small cow only eats 14,600 pounds, and she gave you, she gave you a pound of calf for every 32.4 pounds of feed that she took in. So it's going to cost you more if you put a feed value on every one of those pounds to get the calf out of the bigger cow. Now this still might not change your mind. Well, that bigger calf is going to compensate for the increased feed we gave that cow, right? The answer lies in the carrying capacity of your land. But these carrying capacity calculations were done saying that each cow, the big cow and the small cow, eats 4% of her body weight per day, per year. Usually the figure is around 3, 3.5%, three but I went higher just for, for the heck of it. So on one piece of ground, a piece of ground X number of acres, we can fit three of those small cows with their small calves. Each one of those small calves weighing 450 pounds, you can take them to the sale barn, they'll fetch about 250 a pound, I think, right now. So with the 43,800 pounds of dry matter on your X number of acres, that can hold three of those big cows, and you'll end up with a revenue of 33.75. Now take that same 43,800 pounds of dry matter that you have, that can only feed two of those big cows, and those big calves. Take those big 550 pound calves to the sale barn, you get 13.75 for each of them. But only two calves, so you end up with 27.50. I'd rather have 33.75 than 27.50. So what am I trying to say with all this? That you want to select your cattle for weaning percentage of dam weight, not on weaning weight alone. This is your average cow-calf pair. Pretty good sized calf. This is a lot of what you see. And in that top left picture, that is a high percentage cow in your calf. That is a thousand pound cow, maybe even a little bit less, with a calf that's eight or nine months old. You can really tell the difference between the two. And then there's in the bottom, there is that low percentage cow again, so we can compare the two. Now those calves might not be exactly the same age, but you see what I'm trying to get at here. That small cow ate a lot less for every pound of calf she gave you. Now take home message from this, how to go about measuring this. Weigh your cows and your calves when the calves are about six to nine months of age. You don't have to wean at this time, but it's a good time to do this weight calculation because at that point, that's about the last milk that the calf is going to get out of that cow. From then on, the calf is really gaining under its own power, not due to the dam. So calculating the percentage of the cow weight, you take the calf weight divided by the cow weight, and then you multiply that number by 100. So that will give you the weaning percentage. And then you can rank your entire herd in order of the percentage of her weight that the calf weighs. Only keep your replacements from the top 20%, and then you can call from the bottom up. Now, in this example, I use a small cow and a big cow, 1,000 pounds versus 1,500. You're always going to see that happen. Small cows are always going to come out on top. Another question. Is my water quality good enough? Animal Port Domingo, I read an article in the Stockton Grass Farmer, he says that water quality can be responsible for a gain difference in stockers of up to half a pound per day. So that's a lot. It's a big deal. How do you tell if your water is good enough? Observe the cattle's drinking behavior. The cattle in this tank, they walk up, they stick their nose right down in the water, and they just dive in and start drinking. There's no hesitation involved. If your cattle are walking up to the tank, sniffing the water, licking at the water, playing with it, not really drinking, that means you have a problem. Your water stinks. Why does the water stink? because there's anaerobic bacteria in the water, and in ponds as well, ponds and tanks, same thing, that create nasty smelling waste in deoxygenated water. So how do we fight this? We oxygenate the water, or we kill the bacteria. Here's the way that I learned at Greg Judy is to fight issues with tank water quality. You can make a little tank floater out of a couple of spare bottles you have laying around. That Pepsi bottle is full of air, no holes in it or anything, and that functions to keep Hello? Okay. Okay, so this floater, the um, Pepsi bottle has no holes in it, and that functions to keep the floater on top of the tank, or suspended in the middle of the tank, I should say. The Gatorade. Yeah. 
Huh. Just talk really loud. Okay, the Gatorade bottle does have holes in it, and what's in there is some rocks that you fit in through the top, and a couple of pieces of a chlorine tablet, like up in that right-hand corner. I take that little chlorine tablet, the one-inch tablet. Okay, guess the microphone's not gonna work. that you can get at a pool store. You can use the same ones you use in your pool or spa. And I take it and crush it up, and I only use about a quarter of that at a time that I put in the floater. I have not yet put a full tablet in there. I'm kind of afraid of what that might do in a small tank. But all you need is a little bit of this chlorine. So you put a piece of that little tablet in there, put some rocks in that, in that bottle to keep it suspended in the bottom of the tank, and then you put the lid back on, drill some holes, that piece of string between the two bottles is electric fence wire. It does have metal in it, it's nylon. You don't want to use bale twine or anything that's going to disintegrate. And some people tie a brick to, the, to that second bottle too, so that you have something on the top of the tank, you have a floater in the middle, and then you have that brick in the bottom to keep it weighted. Weight is definitely important because if it's not weighted, the cattle will grab it and flip it on the tank and play with it. What can you just drop the tablet in? I think the reason for this is that it keeps it suspended in the middle of the water and it allows it to kind of move around and more water passes by it, instead of having it just sit on the bottom. So here's the tank on my farm that I did this with. On the left side, that's the tank before I put the floater in. It's got a real bad algae problem. You can't even see to the bottom of it, hardly see a few inches in. And on the right is after just a couple of days with this chlorine in there. The water's cleared up really nice. So got a little algae hanging around, but that's no big deal. I thought that maybe the chlorine would discourage the cattle from drinking it, but it really doesn't. I mean, they don't seem to care about it at all. Everybody has seen this before, too. Cows swimming in your pond. This is not a good thing either. It's another thing that a lot of people accept as normal. But these cows are peeing and pooing in your pond. They're walking in and out of it, so they're pushing one down in it. And what's going to happen after a while is you need to have the pond dug out. And that's expensive. So the solution to this would be to fence your cattle out of your pumps. You can make a ring of electric fence that goes around the water like a target. So you have your shoreline as the outer ring of the target, and then your fence line as your inner ring. You're gonna have to build a fence in the pond. It's not gonna be a fun job. You're gonna have to use fiberglass posts or something like that that won't rot, but it's not gonna work. And so your cattle are about to come into the edge of the pond. Just stick their heads in there and drink, but they're not allowed to go swimming out in there. That's also important if you're going to be using a pond circulator. You can use these to keep your pond open and de-iced over the winter, or you can just use it to aerate the pond and increase water quality if all of your water is coming from pumps. And there are a number of different options available nowadays. You can do solar, electric, or wind. These are from a company called Little River. It's www.pondville.com. I emailed them a while back talking about this, and they just said to make sure that your cattle are not allowed to walk out of the ice. There's a big ranch down in Texas who did this, Cattle walked out on the ice and fell through the ice and died. So make sure that you are using that electric wire in your pond to keep them from walking out in it. So water quality take home. Just watch your cattle drink. So if they're looking at it, you have an issue. They should just stick their noses right down in there and drink, no problems. Buy food and cash, which are really cheap. You can get them at any pool supply store in Walmart. You can get them online. Make a floater, a couple of bottles, put it in your tank. You have to check it probably once a week or every other to see if your chlorine disappears and add more. Those little chunks of chlorine probably do last about a week. Gather up some fencing materials, fiberglass posts, and put some wires up in your ponds to keep the cattle out. And research the feasibility of getting a pond circulator if you have something like that in your budget. <coughs> now, a short review about this before I go on to the next stuff. I want to know who here has heard of every one of these. So monitoring gut fill. Who has heard of that? Okay, good. It's like well, some people can do stuff. Uh, reading my your files. Who's heard of that? All right. Ear and pH. Testing that. Okay. Selecting for hair slick off. Okay. Selecting for weeding percentage. I think it's observing drinking behavior and doing things with the circulators and the lawn wires. Okay, good. Did everyone follow the part about the weaning percentage of all those numbers that I threw out there? Because that's from an article that's going to be running in acres in the spring. I kind of buzzed through that, but that was the gist of it anyway. 
Focus group on climate change, they can do that. And we'll start back up here in five minutes. 